Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello everyone and welcome back to Rival Recon here on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Harry Sethi. The Reds relinquished complete control of their own destiny last weekend, failing to beat an abject Manchester United side for the second time this season at Old Trafford. Klopp's side then followed this up with a humiliating 3-0 home loss to Atalanta in the Europa League to pile the pressure on themselves this weekend as they welcomed Crystal Palace to Anfield on Sunday. With only wins acceptable from here on out, Klopp will be hoping for a reaction from his players and returning first-teamers when Oliver Glasner's struggling Palace side arrive at Anfield this weekend. And joining me on the pod this week to discuss how Palace's season has unfolded, whether they're really too good to go down, and what the future will look like for this side as Glasner takes full control, I'm delighted to welcome on Joe Walker from the Five Year Plan and International Clearance Podcasts. Welcome back, Joe. Good to good to chat with you again. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. It's uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, any excuse to talk football, you know. Yeah, right. It's don't need many excuses. Sometimes you don't want the excuses. Sometimes you sometimes you want to just uh, <laughs> not chat about it. Um, it's only hours on from I, I was I had to do a pod after the game uh, last night, and yeah, I'm not going to do woe is me. Liverpool have given plenty of joy this season, but <laughs> last night they uh, decided to give um, give pain, I think, yes. and, and give lethargy. Uh, obviously, that three nil humbling by. Atalanta at Anfield, um, only the I think it's only the second time lost by that margin in Europe at Anfield for ages. I think the last time was five two defeat for uh, Real Madrid like yonks ago. So yeah, always good to be reminded of that. But yeah, we, we, of course the attention shifts straight back to the Premier League and you know, like uh, Palace coming up to to Anfield this Sunday. And, mm-hmm. and so I just wanted to get really a um, a gist from you, from yourself, really, is to we'll, we'll go into specifics. We'll talk about the new manager, talk about the old manager, and just get your opinion on players and who's been sort of some of the key standouts this season. But at this stage of the season, you know, 14th in the table, 30 points, I think seems seems comfortable. You're not going to be sucked into any sort of um, well, this, of course, like hope not being sucked into any sort of battle around the. Um, the relegation spots because it does it does appear to me anyway that there are there are teams in the league who are who are weaker than than Crystal Palace but feel free to you know it depends on what you're feeling today feel free to correct me um, but I just wanted to get your your view on where Palace find themselves at the moment and get your thoughts on the season so far right so I think the the two good to go down the too good were better than the other teams I think that mentality hasn't really been around within the fan base for too long i think there's okay, been a okay. a slight fear of let's see how you know how leicester fared last season but true uh, yeah. i suppose the the main fear and concern has been we've had some really killer injuries to essentially our four or five best players this season so check the core our player of the year has been out since november december early december maybe even oh, that was a bad um, one wasn't it yeah yeah really bad and we just totally missed him. We're just not prepared for his absence at all. Um, every as missed the first, missed the chunk of the season. Um, uh, Michael Elise has played 11 games this season. He's been incredible in those 11 games, but has, um, we felt that absence too. 
And then Mark Gay is currently injured at possibly until the end of the month. Uh, we've missed missed him terribly. So um, that's one thing, you know, it, injuries happen to everybody. Liverpool have had some pretty extensive injury lists, not just this season, but years prior. I think we've really struggled with the depth this year and we gambled on there being worse teams than us. We've sort of got away with it. I think the points deductions and PSR uh, ramifications have really done us a bit of a favour. I think we'd be sweating a lot more um, otherwise, but we are not winning games. Uh, you know, I think we'll get into the new manager. I think the the thoughts from the fan base are generally positive, but uh, for all these factors, the things that explain away a lot of Palace's bad league performances, um, they can be explained away, but they are, you know, doesn't make it any more enjoyable to watch. And I think that ended up being what saw Roy Hodgson out the door. I think yeah. it's quite a little bit unfairly, but his approach was very much, okay, look, this is what we've got. Let's, let's do the best of what we can. Let's, let's mm. play for points in a very conservative way. And I think that made it even more difficult to stomach as a spectator. Um, and so we've got a manager that's coming in and producing similar results, but just with a slightly more positive outlook on it. Um, yeah. Fitness, fitness is a real issue at the moment. Lack of depth naturally feeds into that. And, you know, Liverpool are a team that can score lots of late goals. Palace have got, uh, uh, this season, I think it's 10 after injury time we've conceded in second half. And right. um, considerably more in the last 15, 20 minutes. So we've essentially been having to take the leading games and just see if we can hold on. And with mixed success to no success, if you like. So... Mm-hmm. It's not. It's it's been a season we've tried to write off since as as far back as November, December. Some fans were saying, "Look, this is just a nightmare. Let's, let's stay up." But it feels a bit of a waste with some great players in the squad that we're never actually ever going to see on the same pitch probably again. I was going to say, I remember when I, I spoke with Palace fans early in the season uh, before the previous game, and I spoke about that that feeling of it being a write off or. Um, just how long Hodgson was going to last at that stage. And I think one, one thing Liverpool fans do know, again, I think just Hodgson was probably just poorly suited to the job of the Liverpool manager anyway. But the one thing that I, I never felt he never helped himself out with is just uh, as you're talking about the, you know, the new manager, pretty similar results, just different outlook, probably different way of speaking about those results. And yeah. there were a number of times this season where I was like, oh, okay, unfortunately Hodgson has done a classic sort of Hodgson in terms of the quotes he comes out with after the game. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he's, he's, you get what he means, but unfortunately it's not how it comes across necessarily. And yeah. it ends up sort of like almost at times chastising the fans for daring to want more than this. And yeah, it's yeah i think it, it, especially if you're going to go through a season where you're struggling for points or being really conservative that's going to come back to bite you it did feel as though in the end it was are you that person who has everything the coolest merch and those must-have fan threads well over at our anfield index shop we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your liverpool collection from our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts sweaters hoodies and hats to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Hodgson could look in, I don't know, super positive, <laughs> completely different sort of person in the interviews after games. He can't be at this stage, of course. Maybe he would have lasted the campaign. But I, I want to get your view on the decision to stick with Hodgson at the start, you know, ahead of the season. And I guess the comparative like lack of investment in the squad this season. Your, just your views on the planning for this season in general and it, it, d- it doesn't seem to have been the most coherent or it seems to have been treading water waiting for something yeah it was a, it was a, a fine mess really I, I it has emerged there's a lot of tension between the ownership there's there's kind of four or five figures there that have significant voting rights between them and they all have different 
uh, motivations, different kind of desires to stay in the club. Some are just would like to get rid of their stake, but just can't find anyone interested enough on the value that they have. Um, and then you have somebody like Steve Parrish that's got all the kind of club, the, the stuff that fans should want, the the kind of representation in the board, but actually has none of his own kind of personal fortune to throw around and uh, influence himself. So it's uh, that kind of really came to light in the summer, I think. I think Hodgson in an ideal world would have gone in the summer. And then I think they looked around at potential candidates and nobody really stood out uh, or no one was particularly ready to come in at that time that they wanted. Um, I think they spoke to Graham Potter who just didn't, wasn't interested. And I, I can, I kind of get that. And I think from what I think Gary O'Neill may have been spoken to, that's where we were going. And that's a name that 12 months on, would be an incredible appointment given what he's achieved. But at that time, mm. there were still doubts about whether the Bournemouth project was, you know, slightly overstated what he'd done there. So it, in the end, we, I think Hodgson was a lovely sort of stopgap for them to revisit in 12 months time again, save some money again, assuming that the three teams coming up were going to struggle, which they have done to be fair. Um, but then I think what also was a huge sticking point, they successfully negotiated a new contract for Michael Elise, which felt like a new signing, but he was, I mean, he was injured till October anyway, but Wilfred Zaha left very late on. I think his deal expired in end of June. And I think when he eventually left sort of late July, uh, or when he eventually flew off to Galatasaray, I think there was days before that, there was the assumption that he was ready to sign another deal because the opportunity he'd been looking for the right deal and opportunity hadn't quite arrived. So I think he was quite content to come back. But then the Galatasaray deal arrived sort of right very late into the summer window or just before the beginning of the season. So that was a bit of a rug pull, I think. I thought they thought they would be able to get away with keeping him on whatever money he wanted. Uh, Michael Elise staying and then we'll just tread water and, and hopefully with all those players on the pitch, have some fun like we did towards the back end. But the combination of injury and then actually not having bought anybody in the summer except for well, what miffed a lot of Palace fans, we signed Dean Henderson for 20 million. He's a highest paid player. And we had an England goalie. We had, we had Sam Johnston really doing well for us. So that I think people were quite bemused on the assumption that we didn't have a lot of money, but we'd spent it on things we didn't need. Yeah. And so whether that was the case, I think the cries from the club have been actually there was money to spend elsewhere, but the right deals weren't there. Mm. The, the players we've signed in January are really good and you just can't help but wonder where, how Roy would have got on if he had them since August instead of, of January. It came a little bit too late for him. I think he only had a couple of games with them. and Yeah, yeah. It just that summer, it, it just I felt think... like infrastructurally they they did they were kind of looking to next year. I think the PSR, as it's come to light, I think we've realised the extent of... Actually, I think so. The big last time we spent big was with under Vieira's first summer. We had right. new in, through investment. We signed Gay, we signed Anderson, uh, we signed um, a number of players for significant fees who are all still here, all still valuable. They've actually their value's gone up. But um, I think mm. that that season leaves the PSR window. I think this coming summer. So I think Palace were hoping we could just get by until another better manager or candidate emerges until the PSR window extends and we can actually spend a lot more money and, you know, we can sell some players and, and we'll, we'll maybe then start a charge up the table, but that everything that could go wrong in that spell has, and it's just been just a horror show. Yeah. It feels as though, I mean, like, I guess for those who've watched um, succession, like it, feel, it feels as though like they, they appointed an elderly man to uh, be uh, in the job of manager, uh, uh, basically as a, as a, a a pain sponge for, yeah. for about twelve to eighteen months, and just yeah. went, yeah, you, you go out there and uh, as you say, just help us drift along until when we're able to sort of really invest in this again, uh, and yeah, try and win some points along the way, and yeah, try and avoid being I like, can. Um, you know, saying anything too antagonistic in in the presses, and I think it just proved a little bit too much. You mentioned those new players who who came in in January and have had a positive impact. Like, do you want to give a little bit more detail on those players and sort of the ones who've like really caught the eye? All, yeah, very, all quite young, right? I mean, Henderson I mean, obviously came in earlier, 26, but the rest of them quite young. 
Yes. So, yeah, uh, um, the January ones in particular still kind of one fits the model that we've been trying to do in terms of young football league signings who we can then bring Premier League experience and probably sell on to then finance the next uh, mm. set of players. Adam Wharton from Blackburn in January is yeah. already looking like a very impressive signing. It was not insignificant money for us. Like we're talking 20 million, but, uh, you know, still finding his feet fitness wise in the Premier League. I think he struggles to hit 70 minutes, but uh, this time next year, I think he'll be just a, a really impressive player that other teams will be looking at. Really nice choice of pass, weight of pass and a tough tackler as well which, you know, a Palace midfield is going to be very busy both directions. So that's been very useful for us, particularly in the absence of Chet Decore continually. Um, and Jefferson Lerma, who we got in the summer on a free transfer, has been excellent, but at the moment is playing centre-half because we've got these injuries going. So Wharton being there has been a, has been very helpful. The, the other January signing that's kind of crept up on everybody at Palace, certainly, was um, Munoz. He's a right wing back. Colombian from the Belgian league. He's 27. And I guess it was very much, we were having some struggles out wide at fullback. We've had, we haven't, we never really replaced Aaron wan five years ago. Um, we've just put Joel Ward back in whose legs aren't yeah. what they were. Nathaniel Klein is still here, believe it or not. And yeah, and they've just, they can't do that sort of progressive, modern fullback job uh, anymore. Wasn't Martin Kelly doing it for you for a while as well? Yes, yes, he did. Yeah. yeah. It's um the sort of same two, three players over a 10 year period. We, we, we signed Nathan Ferguson, a really exciting fullback from West Brom. And he's played one game in four years. I think he just had the horrible injuries, like career threatening. Yes. Um, so we've, for once, I think we kind of took the decision. We need to buy somebody that's ready now rather than a prospect. And Munoz has come in and really changed the way it really helped us be 10, five, 10 yards further up the pitch in every game. He's just this very adventurous fullback that should have scored this season. At least once he, he's, he's always trying to get in behind the defense, always there on one twos and overlaps, which is revolutionary for us on that side. Um, and I think a lot of palace's good work at Anfield on Sunday will probably be via him, which most teams haven't picked up on yet. Hello there. Have you ever found yourself getting ready to watch the Liverpool match? You've got your mates round, you've got your drinks, you've got your snacks, you're all set to go. It's going to be a good day. And then you find out, oh, the game's not actually being broadcast in your region. There's the heartbreak, there's rage, there's despair, there's fury. You're upset. You're looking for a solution. Well, we've teamed up with NordVPN to bring you a game-changing solution. That's right. With NordVPN, you can switch your virtual location to a country where the game's on live. It's like having a global ticket to sports, TV shows, and movies from all around the world. And here's the best part. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Anfield Index, you'll score the best discount on your NordVPN plan. Plus, our link gives you four extra months free on the two-year plan. And that's what we call a winning streak. And if you're sitting there and you're thinking, what if it's not for me? What if I don't like it? What if I'm not getting the use of it? Don't worry about it. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, so it's totally risk-free. I've been using NordVPN to catch all the Liverpool matches and TV shows that I'd normally miss out on. It's totally transformed both my weekends and my TV watching. And not only that, not only does it give me access to stuff from all around the world with the click of a button, it keeps all my data safe. It means that the miscreants, the ne'er-do-wells, what my grandmother would have called scallywags, who lurk on the internet to try and steal your information, can't get your information. NordVPN keeps it safe for you. So don't let geo restrictions bench you this season. Visit nordvpn.com forward slash Anfield Index and make sure that you're in the game, no matter when or where it's being played. Remember, it's not just sports. It's your all-access pass to binge-worthy TV shows and blockbuster movies from all around the globe. NordVPN literally unlocks the world for you and keeps you safe from the world. So don't miss out. Head over to nordvpn.com forward slash Anfield Index let the fun and games begin. You know, it'd be interesting to see exactly how 
how Palace approach it. And I, I want to make, obviously come on to the fact that Hodgson's, you know, loses his job uh, and then uh, there's, there's the appointment of the former Eintracht Frankfurt boss, Oliver Glasner. Uh, want to get your opinion on sort of how, you spoke about Gary O'Neill earlier on and I guess how the changing perceptions of, of, of the job on which he's done and maybe how his um, reputations changed over the past few months as well. What was the reaction to that appointment of of Glasner? You know, I mean, speak for the entire fan base. Let, let me make you do that. But like in terms of like, yeah, what what, what do you think the the reaction to that appointment was, and what have you made of how he's handled himself, I suppose, on and off the pitch uh, so far? So I think people saw his track record uh, at Eintracht Frankfurt and, and even his work at prior clubs, and thought right, this is clearly an excellent manager with with good European pedigree and somebody that has improved teams, improved players. Uh, the kind of concerns from particularly some of the more pro Hodgson, I say pro Hodgson, I mean, people that were sad to see Roy Hodgson go in the way that it did and thought he was dealt a bad hand. As you said, it's just kind of put out to take all the hits. Um, but, you know, if you're your ownership, you don't sack yourself, do you? The only head that can roll, the only variable you can make once a window is closed is, well, I guess that we can change the manager. And, um, I think, but those those that believed in Hodgson keeping us up anyway were worried that a, a, a manager that's not managed in the Premier League, someone that's pro- probably not managed a team that's kind of had to going to have to defend a lot in certain games against, uh, you know, some of the calibre of opposition we've got. How, have we got time for him to learn that, for example, Jeffrey Schlupp is fast, but you don't play him on the right-hand side of midfield? Is he someone that, do we have time for him to learn that Ebre Eze doesn't really work left of a front three? Do we have time for him to learn that Will Hughes cannot be played as the number 10? Like those kind of things that, you know, as the, as the season progresses and we're not getting wins, it's, can we afford for him to learn a lot about the team in a short space of time to turn things around? Um, which that slightly still remains. He's been made some interesting choices. Um, playing some young players that Roy Hudson wouldn't have otherwise done. And it's had mixed effects. Um, you know, I think we lost at Bournemouth a couple of weeks ago. He brought on an 18 year old midfielder and put him at center back. And he made a mistake that led to the winner essentially. And th- those are, those are things I've not really got a problem with, but um, you know, when you can't buy a win at the, it, it's, it's frustrating some people. I, what I would say though, is that he's saying all the right things. The, 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 the it's night and day between the fan what he's saying to fans and the kind of playing the kind of media game and just, just he had an open training session uh, at Celeste Park last week and invited loads of fans down. And I think he's very aware of the kind of frostiness of the previous regime. Um, so he's played that very well. And whether or not it's true, he, he, he has kind of applied it on the pitch with regard, you know, getting some of the same problems with fitness, but, being way less pessimistic about it, way less kind of, well, that's the situation. He's kind of trying to give opportunities to young players here and there because that's all he's got. And I, I think as fans, it's it's not always logical, but you're quite happy to see some of the sort of pure tenets of a football club applied, even when it's not going well. Like, give the kids a chance or, you know, let's, let's it's Luton at home. Give it, let, let's start on the front foot. And it's not yielded the results on the pitch just yet. I think he's still only won the once, but if we do kind of get through to the summer, I think it all seems to be brief that he was, I think his offer initially was to join after Howard Hudson at the end of the season. And we've essentially Mm. managed to convince him to come forward. Um, And I think that was another issue that kept the situation. Roy kind of dead man walking for a little bit was that, I think no one wanted to come in in our current situation, knowing the injuries and thinking, well, this is just going to, I'm going to get hit over the head as well. Cause there's only so much difference we can make. He's accepted that. And I think if we do get over the line this season, I think it will be a totally different side in the summer when he's actually able to implement some of his methods a bit more and, and uh, more of his players as well that I've got a feeling we're going to be selling two or three very big names will go. And that finances some new stand developments that we've got in the, in the pipeline, but also a squad that's better in Glasner and the club's vision. 
Yeah, a lot of players there who I think are like um, rightly admired across the league. Uh, I know certainly the two centre backs have been fantastic signings. Uh, Eze and Elise obviously always take lots of plaudits um, whenever they have one of their games where it's you know, p- particularly showing off their skills. Uh, as you say, not been anywhere near enough of them this season, just based upon on injuries and. You, you hinted there at you know, Glasner and next season seeing more of what he he has in mind for this Palace side. Maybe get some more of his own players in uh, who able help him to implement that style. What do you think that that style is in terms of you know I guess based upon what we've seen of him before his previous teams and um, if he had if he, let's say he gets all those players that he wants in in the summer uh, and is able to sort of rebuild this team in his own image what does that version of Palace look like? I suppose it's difficult to say right now, but what sense do you get is the kind of team you'd like to build? He seems very set on the 3-5-2 or 5-3-2, I guess, if you're out of position. Yeah. Which has loads of them. They love it. It's lo- yeah. <laughs> and it hasn't necessarily suited the set of players always available to us. I think if everybody was fit, I think we would actually have quite an impressive team in that setup. But um, there are some players in the current team that maybe don't suit it that well. Tyreek Mitchell's very much trying to grow into the left-sided, the, the wing-back role on the left side. I think very, very more than fine and adequate defensively, but not naturally adventurous um, in the other direction. So that's that's been a sort of slow burn. Also, we are hemorrhaging centre-halves fitness-wise. We've got Mark Gay, he's been out for a while. Chris Richards, the reserve centre-back, American international. Nice, interesting player. He's injured at the moment. Might be back for the weekend, but I think he's injured. Um, Rob Holding, we signed in the summer. I don't know if you remember. He's made one league appearance, I think. Maybe not at all. And he's already in a kind of ambassadorial role. Like, just no real, ever really any update on what his injuries are and how long far away he is. So, we've not seen him. Yeah, that's a weird one, yeah. Yeah, and so then you drop down to... James Tompkins, uh, or uh, who, let's put it this way, we're playing Jefferson Lerma at centre-back instead of James Tompkins because, well, yeah, exactly. So, um, I think that's fair on both Palace and James Tompkins at this stage, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And playing a 3-5-2, some people are starting to say, well, if we're really short of centre-halves, do we really want to be playing um, a back three of Anderson, um, Jefferson Lerma and then Joel Ward at centre back, who has been doing okay there. But it, you know, Joel, I think some people are still stunned that he's at Palace. I, 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 he's a good servant, but we're coming towards the end of his career now. But we still seem to be playing him and needing to play him every week, which is crazy. The delicious ice cold taste of Dr. Pepper has a lasting effect on people. Lindsay from Sacramento said, Pro tip 40 degrees is the perfect temperature for an ice cold Dr. Pepper. Why is 40 degrees the perfect temperature for Dr. Pepper? We brought in Sue from Duluth, Minnesota to tell us. Oh, yeah, I know a thing or two about cold. Oh, that right there is the perfect kind of ice cold for Dr. Pepper. Mm. I'd share that with my friend Nancy. She likes Dr. Pepper, too, you know. My cold All right, that'll be all, Sue. Having a perfect temperature for your Dr. Pepper, it's a pepper thing. Inspired by real fan posts. Yeah, I think sometimes with players like that, I think at clubs, you almost need to just remove the temptation for four managers I think <laughs> these players are, oh, oh they're still in the squad okay I'll play them <laughs> it's like whatever logic's in the head it ne- never always works out that well I'm, I'm sure I mean, it's a completely different situation but I'm pretty confident that Johnny Evans didn't go to Manchester United to be playing yes. anywhere near as much as he's ha- had to do this season uh, he looks thoroughly pissed off I have to say <laughs> somebody who's <laughs> been there has been wheeled out against some pretty difficult opposition uh, yeah and I think I think Tom Kitts is probably at the same stage of his career as well <laughs> doesn't really yeah. I'm, I'm sure he'll be taking on an ambassadorial role pretty soon as well but he's been a hell of a servant considering how long he's how long he's been at the club um mm-hmm. I, I want to then i suppose just bring it on briefly to so you, you said at the moment the fans the mentality is not that you were too good to go down uh but maybe that a couple of things have helped you out here and there that some of the fines uh teams being weaker than you but I mean, I mean, generally, what are like what are your expectations for the remainder of the season? As you say, it's all very well as positive outlook, but you need to get these results from from somewhere. I mean, what are your expectations for for the remainder? It's, it's Liverpool next. It's, it's then West Ham and Newcastle at home, Fulham away, United uh, home. 
Wolves Villa on the final day. Um, there's, there's points in there for in terms of sort of are you targeting specific fixtures that you think are going to be really key between now and the end of the season? I think we've lost the privilege of that, if I'm honest. I think okay. that, I think that was there initially, and then no, this run anything. this run of games that um, Glasner's came into, we drew we drew at home with Luton, we yeah. drew away at Forest, we lost, lost the at Bournemouth, yeah. and suddenly we're, we're then going into the City game and yourselves, and yeah, you're starting to sweat a bit. I, I know that the, 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 the difficulty in the remaining fixtures isn't all that high as that, but it's, you know, anything will do at this point. I think we're, we're already talking, some of the fans are talking about, you know, how many more points will do to stay up. And are you, some people, are, I've seen a lot of people just assuming we're going to maybe win one or two games between now and the end of the season. And that should do it. But it, it's, the the points are eluding us. It's getting a little bit itchy. I I know that they have, yeah, well, the situations of those teams below, below us have helped us out a little bit. But um, it's not. I, I don't think anyone wants to be too complacent. There's a there's an old story that keeps coming up among older fans. It was a little bit past my time, but I think it's around '95, maybe 1993 even. Um, the Premier League reduced from 22 teams to 20, and in doing so, four teams went down, and we were the fourth from bottom team. We were. Three, we were nine points clear with three games, and Oldham had three games in hand or something because well, it was three games to go. Oldham had a game in hand or whatever because uh, they were in a cup run or something like that. Anyway, we lost our final three games. We did a standing ovation, three games to go at home, kind of uh, walked around the pitch. You know, that will keep us safe. Nine points clear, three games left. Oldham win their last three games. I think two of those are at Man United and Aston Villa, who were sort of second in the league that year. And we go down on the last day in the fourth from bottom spot. And so there's this kind of urgency, even now, 20 years on, to not be complacent with anything in a survival race because you cannot, you just cannot depend on Luton Town not picking up five extra points than us between now and the season. That's one surprise win a couple of draws. You know, it's... It's 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 no it's it's dangerous down there. I just don't like being, uh, yeah, it's it's not given the the inability to pick up points in games against teams our level. You just can't. You, it's just not worth thinking we're okay, basically. So any 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 games coming up, it might it's unlikely to be yourselves because you finish games so well normally. I. Yeah, those games against the Newcastles midweek, West Ham's, we're going to have to actually really take it to them. Otherwise, you know, you don't want to go down to the last day or two days, mm. two games left, needing something. That's horrible. I have to say, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm just, I want the the dullest 2-0 uh, in history is, is is what I would grab right now. I, I just I just want there to be, I mean, I think points. I just think it's straight. Yeah, points for sure. But I think it's... Uh, I mean, I think particularly galling to to have not picked up more points against that Manchester United team. Uh, mm. I think really for me, having absolutely battered them uh, on a couple of occasions, but just <laughs> refused, almost refused to take the chances that we that we created. Uh, obviously, got what we deserved in those situations. And yeah, I would I would hope that last night has uh, made a lot of a lot of those Liverpool players. Um, pretty upset i mean i'm fairly upset about it still so i'm yeah. hoping, hoping they're pretty upset about it and uh, uh there's a couple coming back as well and the likes of trent and um allison i imagine will be back for the weekend and jota is is, is back for the game so there are these names there who are the more ruthless amongst the bunch who and the, the ones who have enough quality even if they don't hit the ground running you imagine to have moments where they're going to be able to take take games away from teams but we'll have to have to see. I think my my big worry with with this season has probably been: did we try and do too much and try and like uh, do all the cups again, and it's starting to you know right. fatigue playing its its role, or is it also just a combination of um, some of these players aren't aren't the killers that we've had in the past? I think that's 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 fair as well. And then I think there's also that third intangible around it, you know, it being however many games left now uh, for for Klopp and. 
I always figured at one stage it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of emotion involved in that. Yeah. Uh, and how are they going to deal with the emotion? Is it going to be riding a wave or is it going to be just actually a bit of a emptying out? So we'll have to see. I think it's easy to say that now after you've, you've, you've had like you know, a bad result, but the, the United game was a good performance and just didn't didn't take the chances that we needed to. But hopeful that some of those players are coming back will. Yeah, be the adults in the room that we perhaps need need them to be at this uh, at this stage. But actually, before we go into the game itself, I wanted to ask you: in amongst all of this, you know, sort of turbulence this season, who have been the players who who have stood out? I mean, who, who, the players that have given you joy in those moments, and um, or maybe even risen to the occasion under the new manager so far. I mean, who, who are the ones you, you 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 think can look back on this campaign and actually emerge with with some credit? So Jefferson Lerma certainly has his breakthrough. His first season with us has been, he's been very dependable. Sadly, Decore's injury meant he's probably been asked to do a lot more than we planned. But when they were together, they've worked really well. We had a really interesting midfield there. Um, but he's been dependable almost throughout. I couldn't tell you many bad games that he's had for Palace um, in the various positions that he's been asked and roles that he's been asked of. Um, first half of the season, Jordan Ayew was looking like far and away the player of the season, was coming up with goals and assists, which is not uh, the most obvious side of his game that you'd say for us, or, or even just across his career, really. No, I know. I've got, I've got, I've got a lot of members of the family who, are, who, yeah, that's not what they, that's not what they count on from, from, no. from Jordan. No, and uh, but he was really, really stepping up to the plate in the absence of. Mm other forward players, you know, without Zaha, when Elise and they were injured together. Um, and the, we brought a Brazilian teenager called Mateus Franca in the summer, who just Roy Hudson just did not fancy. He's like 18, 19, spent upwards of sort of 15, 20 million on him. And Roy Hudson just didn't, didn't want him. Um, he's injured at the moment as well. So Ayu was kind of the talisman and actually came through um, alongside uh, Epson, Otis Edward got a few goals early on in the season. The the standout candidate outside Michael Elise is getting a goal and assist every game whenever he did play. Um, the standout candidate across the season has incredibly been the sort of laughing stock player of our squad. Really, um, Jean Philippe Mateta, we bought, we've had sort of coming up three years, four years now. And every window he's been since he's signed, we have been right. Okay, are we getting rid? Where does he want to go? Um, we'll sell him for five to ten million and fund some other strikers we like. Because he was six foot four. Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a Tad Predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa, he does Anfield Index. He presents a Tad Predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL Roundtable, they're every week after the Premier League match week so make sure you listen to everything we're doing on epl index and follow us there on twitter at epl index thank you bye-bye got 12 goals in half a season in the bundesliga for mines about four years ago we get him in on loan that with a view to make permanent after 18 months some weird sort of semi-covid complicated delayed deal um he just doesn't play under hodgson literally two starts i think um, and we think, oh, he'll be on his way. Vieira has him, comes in just before he's about to sell him. There's an injury crisis. He scores his first sort of league goal for Palace or something and then just has a run in the team. That really nice run under the Vieira's first season where we get to the FA Cup semi final. He's a big part of that team. He's just this quite instinctive poacher, limited, but still like really helps the better players in our side. Then Hodgson comes back in the second season. It doesn't quite make sense. He's six foot four, but he doesn't really know his physicality. doesn't jump for the ball very well. He's losing like heading aerial battles with smaller center backs. And yeah, people were just like this guy, you know, we had a good little six month patch out of him, but it's time to go. And then this season again, 
Uh, Hodgson doesn't really fancy him, but he gets a hat trick in the Carlin Cup or sorry, Capital One Cup, uh, and then he stays instead of leaves. And since Christmas, he's been our best player, unquestionably. Has sort of like been aware of his physicality suddenly. So I can't give it all credit to Glasner. Hodgson's definitely played a factor in that. He's now a real aerial threat, threat, and as just consistently improving the players around him and helping create chances for others as well as himself. And he's now on six or seven goals, which is yeah, not great, but, but he was not the starting striker until probably December. So really, really in a good run of form. And for the, for the level that we're at and the money we're probably trying not to spend on strikers, he's actually really doing a nice job for us. And if he continues his form between now and, you know, the end of May, he probably does get it both on ability but all, and d- what he's done, but also I think the slight surprise factor that he was able to, to pull this out of the hat this season. And then just finally, I guess, come over in your, coming over to the game this weekend and uh, trip up to Anfield. I mean, how, how do you expect Gladner to approach approach that game? I mean, there is the context that we've been discussing, right, of, well, from my side, hoping that Liverpool are... Uh, are angry and there's there's players coming back and it's uh it's it's a performance to 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 bounce back. But in terms of how you think Palace are going to approach it, like from a tactical perspective, um, there's that pace that does exist on the break that could be there to be to be used and also da- dangerous from from set pieces in my mind that could be complete rubbish. But like do do tell me as you say, Matet in Matet are in good form of late. Yeah, how do you think they're going to approach it? Maybe even similar to how I suppose Palace approached the. Uh, the game against City, even though they're a very different side. Yeah, set, set pieces are while set pieces are a threat, corners aren't. So we haven't we haven't scored from over sort of 120 corners, I think. Oh, right. uh, okay. So that that's that you're safe there in that regard. But we'll just wait. Yeah. In, yeah, 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 yeah. But in terms of our general approach, I think what Glasner has done, which has won a lot of kind of fans and 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 uh, enjoyment out of the fan base, is that we do come out strong. I think I think his approach is we haven't got the energy levels to do 90 minutes, so rather than he's like let's let's get what we can and then if we tire we tire. So we have taken the lead in all but one of his games in charge, um, even a City game that we saw last week. That was a great demonstration of how we tend to get goals at the moment. We we press we press high, we cause mistakes. Um, we win the ball off the defenders and the midfielders, and and just pounce. We're not the we're not as pacey as we used to be um, in terms of us on the on the break, but it has still produced and yielded a lot of the goals we've had under him. Uh, what may boost that for us on the Sunday is that the you know the, at the time of recording, I think shortly after his press conference on Friday, and uh, he said Michael Elise is in contention to start which is massive. Honestly, on set pieces, uh, open play on the right, on the left, just great technique. We've got fit, all kinds of finishes in him, but also just one of the best crosses of the ball I've seen at Palace. So he makes a massive difference in that style of play, I think, in terms of capitalising on mistakes and errors. I do fear that you kind of got them all out of your system after that Atalanta game. Yeah, you know, so, but if there are any similar situations like that, I think we're set up knowing that's, that's, we're probably telling our team that that's the formula. Glasner will be kind of encouraging that kind of work. Um, what is likely to happen is that we then tire after about an hour and you just don't see any of, as we won't even be necessarily defensive, quote unquote, in our style, but we will run out of effort to be able to keep replicating what we did in the first half and that's where your opportunities will come if they haven't come already most of our goals have come in that set up second half just tiring completely the subs are not the same level and we kind of cave in really um it, you know one once one goes in there tends to be particularly a team like yourselves that tends to follow another one or two shortly after so mm. that if 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 we can hold out i i wouldn't shock me if we took the lead in the game but Beyond that, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily it's not an indication of the result at full time at all. Yeah, and I think Liverpool's uh, results of late uh, into sort of like the, the just lack of clean sheets. I think it's like three and twelve or whatever. Mm. Um, like we we do concede goals. Uh, well, have done. I mean, I think I think uh, well, I'd, I'd expect it looks like as though Allison will be back on on the weekend, but has been out for quite a while, so yeah. might not might not be sort of immaculate. 
best, but I mean, Kelleher sort of threw one in last night, unfortunately, despite being really good of late. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But I think, yeah, I'm just delighted Elise is in contention. That's <laughs> great, great. It's, it's about time for his uh, one of his highlight reel moments again, I suppose. But I think it's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see what it's like. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd imagine there's going to be a few more of the first teamers on the Liverpool side who come back in, who've, who've been out for a long time, actually. I think uh, the side's done, c- coped so well without them that at, at times you do forget how long some of these some of these guys have been out. And I think it may be just, like with last night and some recent results, these these kids, or these uh, squad squad players who've come in to, to help out whilst the, the first teamers have been out, maybe just starting to reach the limits. But yeah, we'll see. I think it's going to be, Interesting to see what the response is from Liverpool to to such a poor performance last night, and see what the approach is from Palace. I think it's um, a game where there's not much to lose, but like still, I think there's uh, Liverpool's approach does does provide opportunities for for some of those some of those Palace players. And I've seen Anderson and, and Gay played really well against us uh, in the past as well. So wouldn't be surprised at all. But just wanted to yeah, thank you, Joe, for coming on and. Given us your thoughts on on Palace and it's like this is you know from what you said it's not been not been the most fun of seasons to be a Palace fan and have to deal with sort of like this this sense of drift but it does seem as though you know, Glasner you know been brought in early but has will have more of those tools that he needs to start shaping the team and his image next season so yeah really really appreciate you coming on no it's a pleasure always um thank you for having me on yeah it's it's nice to kind of articulate sometimes. You don't often get these chats about your team in a, in a way to to other fans that kind of yeah. get a nice picture of the Premier League. So yeah, and they're nice to articulate kind of where we are and and just makes me feel slightly more reassured. If it, I don't know if I sounded really full of dread, but just try you know try not to be complacent, but yeah, kind of content with dealt a bad hand, but you know next there's always next season. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I'm not going to ask you about the title race because I've, you know, I've, 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 I've started to get I've started to down myself on this. But um, but yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. As, as long I, th- I think I'm at the stage where I just I need to deprive North London of uh, of joy. I just can't. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what it's about that. But I got a couple of uncles in the in the WhatsApp chats. So are getting a bit too Ooh, yeah, bit too bit too cocky. Uh, to, to say these are the same people who who messaged me after Liverpool lost one game against Watford in a title winning season because uh, we weren't invincible so yeah those guys they're, they're back they're back again and they're, they're oh, rowdy my. yeah but uh, to all those who are listening in as well like, uh, the, 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 appreciate you listening to these rivalry cons uh, throughout the season uh, there'll be another one after the next Atalanta game uh, there'll be a, a way to Fulham I expect that to be a tricky game to be honest so yeah that's going to be uh, live just before the Fulham game on April 21st but between now and then yeah do check out the other great content on uh, on Anfield Index Pro but yeah we'll see you ahead of that game against Fulham We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically there's nothing quite like fan engagement and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.